folks and welcome back to another lecture on genetics. In this lecture, we'll look at how Mendel's observations allowed other scientists to piece together some of the other parts of the inheritance problem. That is, where are heredity factors located in a cell? For many decades after Mendel's conclusions in, in the 1860s, heredity factors were just a concept. That is, no one had any idea what was physically being passed from parent to offspring. Today we know that genes, or Mendel's ideas of factors, are located along chromosomes. We can tag particular genes with fluorescent dyes that will show up under the microscope, as seen here in this image. Four glowing dots appear on these chromosomes. We call the location of a particular gene a locus. Two identical alleles on sister chromatids, each on homologous chromosomes. In the late 1800s, many improvements in microscopy helped scientists work out the process of mitosis and meiosis. With the discovery of chromosomes and the process of mitosis, meiosis, and fertilization, scientists quickly drew parallels between what they saw in chromosome behavior and the behavior of Mendel's heredity factors. Let's use Mendel's pea plant experiment to demonstrate these parallels. Starting with two true breeding parent plants and follow them through the F1 and F2 generations. The genes we'll follow are for seed color, allele capital Y for the dominant yellow color seed and lowercase y for the recessive green. And seed shape, capital R for dominant round shape and lowercase r for the recessive wrinkled shape P. It was hypothesized that these two genes are located on different chromosomes. The dark bands represent the loci of each of these genes on the chromosomes. Peas actually have seven pairs of chromosomes, but we'll just show two here for simplicity. We know that each of these parents, being homozygous for each gene, can only make one kind of gamete. That is, this parent can only pass on the yellow and round alleles and this one only the green and wrinkled alleles. A test cross results in the expected F1 generation phenotype, yellow round seeds, and a, and a heterozygous genotype. The germ cells from this generation go through their normal cell cycle, copy their chromosomes making sister chromatids, and in metaphase 1 of meiosis 1, is where we can demonstrate both the law of segregation and independent assortment of Mendel's heredity factors, or genes, on chromosomes. Two possible arrangements of chromosomes demonstrate independent assortment, that is, alleles of genes on non-homologous chromosomes assort independently during gamete formation. Their separation at anaphase 1 demonstrates segregation, the two alleles for each gene separate during gamete formation. A heterozygous individual for two traits whose genes are, are on different chromosomes can make up to eight different varieties of gametes. We learned earlier that we can predict how many variations can be made using the formula 2 to the n, where n is equal to the number of heterozygous alleles. So there are two different alleles here. 2 to the second power is 4 four different gametes. Fertilization recombines the alleles producing the familiar four different phenotypes in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotype. So we can see that the early scientists hypothesis about the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis and fertilization paralleled Mendel's observations about the inheritance of two factors for each characteristic trait. But they needed evidence to support this. This evidence would not come until the early 20th century from an embryologist named Thomas Hunt Morgan. He began experimenting with fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, at Columbia University in New York. Fruit flies are a great specimen for studying embryology because they, re they reproduce quickly. A mating pair can produce up to 100 offspring in just under two weeks Morgan set out to use the fruit fly to examine this chromosome basis of inheritance theory. Most Drosophila melanogaster flies look identical to one another, to us anyway. They have these red eyes, normal shaped wings, 
tan bodies, hairy legs, etc. These traits happen to be normal and quite dominant. Morgan searched for alternative phenotypes in Drosophila, and it took two years before he discovered one. It was a white-eyed male fly. Later he discovered that this white-eyed trait was heritable. Traits most commonly observed in nature, such as red eyes, are called wild type. Traits that are alternatives to the wild type, such as white eye, are called mutant phenotypes because they're due to alleles assumed to have originated as changes or mutations in the wild type allele or gene. Morgan invented a notation for symbolizing alleles that is still in use today. For a given characteristic in flies, the gene takes its symbol from the first mutation discovered. For example, the gene for white eye is symbolized by the letter W, the first letter in the mutation for white eye color. A superscript of a plus sign signifies the allele for a wild type trait, red eyes. In his first famous experiment, he crossed the white eyed male with a wild type female. The F1 generation produced the predictable results, all red eyes. This is consistent with what Mendel would have predicted, suggesting that the wild type, red eyes, is dominant. Morgan then bred his F1 generation to each other. He observed the predictable 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio in the F2 generation. But he did make an odd discovery. All of the white-eyed offspring were males. About half of the F2 generation male flies were red-eyed and the other half were white-eyed. After many identical matings, Morgan got the same results. So he concluded that the fly's eye color is related to its sex or gender. A female fruit fly has two X chromosomes and a male has an X and a Y. The correlation between the trait for eye color and the male sex suggested to Morgan that the gene involved in his white-eyed mutant was located exclusively on the X chromosome and no corresponding allele on the Y chromosome. Follow this reasoning here and see how it works. For the white-eyed male, a single mutated allele on his X chromosome is responsible for his phenotype. Crossing this male with a true breeding wild-type female, having two wild-type alleles for red eye, produces the F1 generation with all red eyes. Following the X and Y chromosome and their alleles in the F2 generation, we can see how only the males of this generation have white eyes. Morgan's finding of a correlation between a particular trait and an individual's sex provided support for the chromosome theory of inheritance, namely, that a specific gene is carried on a specific chromosome. That's enough for today. In the next video, we'll look at some other things that Thomas Hunt Morgan contributed to our understanding of, an, of genetics. I hope that was helpful, that you can take some notes. If you have any questions, bring them to class, and we'll see you then.